Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Throughout this mini-series running up to COP24 in Katowice, we've been following the commentary of this IPCC report fairly closely. This week we reach the final chapter of the report in which the IPCC look at the effects of climate change on human beings around the world. After all, as the report reminds us, humans are at the centre of global climate change. Their actions cause anthropogenic climate change and social change is the key to effectively responding to climate change. Back in 2015, the IPCC introduced the concept of Climate Resilient Development Pathways, or CRDPs, which in their words, aimed to transform the development pathways themselves toward greater social and environmental sustainability, equity, resilience and justice. Climate change and climate variability worsen existing poverty and tend to widen existing inequalities between gender, age, race, class and disability. Chapter 5 is packed full of data and references to a multitude of external studies, but essentially it's structured around two main tenets. It revisits the existing United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and uses them as guiding principles in recommending actions and it highlights areas where there may be potential risks associated with accelerated transitions to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. By 2030, even at 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, the IPCC assessed that 122 million extra people will find themselves in extreme poverty, mainly due to higher food prices and declining health. The report references this table, which looks a bit complicated, but it's just a list of countries with a range of estimates for gross domestic product per capita, which is the accepted measure of a country's economic well-being. So the dark grey band represents the very likely projected range, and then the lighter grey sections show the wider range of possibilities at either end of the extremes. Any country where the entire range of possibilities is worse than today's position, in other words, where people's standard of living goes backwards in every projected scenario, gets highlighted in light and dark magenta. So at 1.5 degrees of warming, that's 19 countries. But feed the numbers into a 2 degrees warmer world and you get this result. In 73 of the 149 countries assessed, human beings like you and me can look forward to a guaranteed deterioration in their standard of living, even in the very best case scenario. So essentially, all those places in the world that already face the biggest social and economic challenges today will have far bigger challenges at 2 degrees of warming than they're likely to have at 1.5 degrees. All of which brings us to the first of the two key points we looked at at the start of the programme, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The report highlights four key principles and caveats that global governments are going to need to embrace if we want sustainable development to lead to effective adaptation. Number one, integrated transformation. And what the IPCC is saying here is that problems and solutions can't be addressed in isolation. So for example, ending poverty is often, in principle, a highly effective form of climate adaptation, but only if increased household wealth is actually directed towards risk management and management strategies. And it also only works if affordable finance and government funding or subsidy can be made available for all the necessary adaptations. Number two, inclusive transformation. All over the world, people face socio-economic barriers, but of course our climate doesn't care about these arbitrary human constructs. So we need to either break them down or at least circumnavigate them so that all parts of all societies are included. The report cites the example of national education efforts and indigenous knowledge, both targets of sustainable development goal number four, and both of which enhance information sharing invariably leading to better resilience and a reduced risk of implementing inappropriate adaptations in the first place. Number three is social equality transformation. The Sustainable Development Goals 4, 5, 10 and 16 all touch on this area. For example, Goal 5 supports measures that reduce women's vulnerabilities and allow women to benefit from adaptation. Goal 10 looks at mobilisation of climate finance, carbon taxation and environmentally motivated subsidies all of which can reduce inequalities, advance climate mitigation and adaptation, and be conducive to strengthening and enabling environments for resilience building. And number four is security transformation. 
The report tells us when sustainable development promotes livelihood security, it enhances the adaptive capacities of vulnerable communities and households. Once again, the sustainable development goals play their part. Goal 11 is all about adaptation within cities to reduce harm from disasters, with Goal 6 specifically addressing access to water and sanitation, and Goal 16 calling for strong institutions to actually get these things done in urban environments and elsewhere. Goal 2 contains targets that promote adaptation in agricultural and food systems, and Goal 3 strives to reduce infectious diseases and provide health cover to improve health-related adaptation. However, and there always seems to be a however in these climate policies, it'll be crucial that we don't overlook the second key point that we highlighted right at the start of this program, and that is the potential risks associated with accelerated transitions to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So I've picked out just a few of the many examples the report provides as a warning against hasty and badly thought through initiatives. Sustainable development goal number two is called Zero Hunger, which relates to agricultural adaptations in crops, livestock and food systems designed to maintain or increase production. Farmers with effective adaptation strategies tend to enjoy higher food security and lower levels of poverty. Well adapted agricultural systems contribute to safe drinking water, better health, biodiversity and social equity, and climate smart agriculture helps with food security. All of which is very good, but adaptations may be advantageous to those who can afford technological solutions. And they could actually increase risk for human health, oceans and access to water if fertiliser and pesticides are used without regulation or when irrigation reduces water availability. Changing the crop mix can remove foods that local people rely on and land and water diversion can take away the incomes of poorer farmers. For example, in the Mekon River Basin, where multiple dams built for hydropower development have increased food insecurity and poverty in the region, costing Thailand an estimated 11 billion US dollars in GDP and Laos and Cambodia about 9 billion US dollars each. And even where, on the face of it, a good economic result is being achieved, like in the Bolivian Altiplano, where subsistence farmers have been transformed into world-leading quinoa producers their success was followed by a loss of social cohesion and traditional values compounded by dispossession of land and property and the loss of the existing ecosystem. A stark reminder of the need for a holistic approach. The same kind of holistic thinking will be needed in our urban environments. Loads of great initiatives are already happening, like heat early warning systems that help reduce injuries, illnesses and deaths, a target of sustainable development goal number three good information, improved detection of climate sensitive diseases and improved provision of basic healthcare services are all positive steps. The creation of urban wetlands as flood control measures is in many regions a smarter move than trying to build concrete and steel flood barriers at city boundaries. But in hotter countries these very wetlands can breed mosquitoes and could force people to move away from their homes, something that causes physical and mental upheaval which is exactly what goal number three is trying to avoid. Air conditioning is a very effective way to combat heat stress. The number of units is expected to triple by 2050, but the more we install, the higher the energy consumption. And energy consumption is something that goal number 13 is trying to reduce. And then there's the age old problem of overcoming entrenched practices and procedures, often sponsored and supported by councils and governments who are reluctant to change. According to the report, this kind of intransigence can constrain adaptation futures by reinforcing dominant political economic structures and processes and narrowing option spaces. This leads to maladaptive pathways that preclude alternative locally relevant and sustainable development initiatives and increase vulnerabilities. Such dominant pathways tend to validate the practices, visions and values of existing governance regimes and powerful members of a community while devaluing those of less privileged stakeholders. Even here in London, the established mainstream thinking promotes adaptation resilience based on self-reliance, which tends to increase the burden on low-income citizens, the elderly, migrants, and others who generally can't afford things like flood insurance or expensive kit to protect themselves against heat waves. Electrification of our urban transport systems is undoubtedly a great step forward, 
but it may trigger an increase in electricity prices, which once again will impact on the poorer people in our society unless some form of subsidy can be put in place. Forward thinking governments can and will do this though, as part of laying out the foundations for compact, connected, low carbon, sustainable cities, which is basically goal 11. And if people can be persuaded to actually increase their physical activity with less reliance on cars for short journeys and greater use of public transport, then we're helping with goals 3, 11 and 12, and most likely improving fair access for everyone to basic facilities, which is part of goal 10. But we need to design the infrastructure and the regulations to improve personal safety and security and reduce the number of road accidents involving this greater number of pedestrians. And then there's Brazil, where the Amazon rainforest lives. Oh dear. At the time of publishing their report, only a few weeks ago, the IPCC were able to include this quote. Brazil promotes low per capita greenhouse gas emissions, clean energy sources, green jobs, renewables, and sustainable transportation while slowing rates of deforestation. Yet concerns remain regarding persistent inequalities, ecosystem monetization, lack of participation in green style projects, and labour conditions and risk of displacement in the sugarcane ethanol sector. What were concerns a few weeks ago must now be regarded as potential catastrophes under the proclamations of the far-right government of Jair Bolsonaro that swept to power on October the 7th. The report concludes that addressing the uneven distribution of power is critical to ensure that societal transformation does not exacerbate poverty and vulnerability or create new injustices but rather encourages equitable transformational change. So my last suggestion for Antonio's notebook is unashamedly aspirational. A fundamental examination of the values, ethics, attitudes and behaviours that underpin each nation an agreement on how to move from local to global solutions with a fair and equitable distribution of responsibilities, rights and mutual obligations between nations. And if you're keen to delve a bit further into this week's subject matter, I can highly recommend this book, The Great Escape, by economist and Nobel Prize winner Angus Deaton. But that pretty much wraps up this mini-series looking at the 1,000-page IPCC report. It's been a bit of a marathon, so if you've stuck with it all the way through, then I really do appreciate your support. If you're new to the channel and you think these programmes have been a useful contribution to the debate around climate change, mitigation and adaptation, then please do subscribe to raise our profile with the YouTube search algorithms and get the message out to as many people as possible. It doesn't cost you a penny to do that and you don't get badgered by any emails or any other spam from me. All you need to do is go to my welcome page on YouTube and hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell so you get notified whenever new videos come out and you can get to that page by clicking here. As always though, thank you very much for watching, have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.